welcome to our Spring Child Welfare Dialogue. For those of you who have not come to these before, um, we are, <coughs> these uh, lectures are sponsored by um, our Child Welfare Training Program at UW-Madison. And um, they, our grant affords us the opportunity <coughs> to bring in a nationally recognized a professional in the area of child welfare twice a year. And these lectures are open to both our students who are in our child welfare training program as well as to professionals in the community to learn a little bit about some um, new innovations in child welfare. So this spring we are very excited to welcome Dr. Gary Mallon here and I'm going to read his extensive bio <laughs> to us. He's been in the field for a really long time and um, so we're really pleased to be able to have him here to talk with you this morning. Um, uh, Dr. Mallon is the Julia Lathrop Professor of Child Welfare and the Associate Dean of Scholarship and Research at the Silverman School of Social Work at Hunter College in New York City. He's worked in the field for over 42 years. He's been a child welfare practitioner, an advocate, an educator, and a researcher. Dr. Mallon was the first child welfare professional in the country to research, write about, and develop programs for LBGTQ youth in child welfare settings. And he's also written extensively about LBGTQ foster and adoptive parenting. And he's gonna to talk to you about that today. Little bit. Uh, Dr. Mallon's scholarship and practice has been recognized through multiple awards, and he's been inducted into um, in 2014 as a fellow of the American Academy of Social Work and Social Welfare. In 2017, Dr. Mallon was awarded the Adoption Excellence Award from the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. He also serves on numerous editorial boards and is the senior editor of the professional journal Child Welfare and the author and editor of more than 23 books, some of which you've read in your classes. Um, he's lectured and ex worked extensively throughout all 50 states and internationally in Argentina, Australia, Canada, Cuba, Indonesia, Israel, Ireland, and the United Kingdom. Dr. Mallon earned his doctorate in social welfare from the City University of New York at Hunter College holds an MSW from Fordham University and a BSW from Dominican College. Dr. Mallon also lives the talk he talks. In addition to being a child welfare professional for his entire career, he has off yeah. okay now it's on great thank you thanks for that nice introduction which you're always embarrassed about because you write it yourself so you know <laughs> and then, then when you sit there and somebody reads it you're like oh maybe I should have made it a little shorter um, but in any case <clears throat> thank you for having me I, I, I love what I do so it, it's always a pleasure to come and talk to students and, and faculty and clinicians and folks who are in the field about the kinds of things that you're excited about um, and in a format like this I hope it really is a dialogue um, I have nine slides that's it but I have no problem talking and I hope you don't either so we can you know really kind of talk about things um, I always think PowerPoint's good and bad right you know it's a good good thing to kind of frame out a little bit about what you're talking about but it's horrible when people just read it right um, so I promise you I won't just read it I just kind of used it as a little bit of an outline um, I, I didn't even know what to call what I was going to talk about today because there's lots of things but um, I've actually been in the field now for 43 years so um, I thought, you know, maybe let's just reflect a little bit on <clears throat> kind of the experience of being a child welfare professional in the field for that long, 43 years is longer than, as I'm looking around the room, most of you were alive. A couple of you were with me, but some of you, most of you were not. And um, just to kind of reflect a little bit on, you know, why child welfare, you know, and, and kind of what are the current trends that are going on in child welfare um, from a, a policy and practice perspective, and then also kind of what are maybe not the things that child welfare is talking about, but we need to be talking more about. Um, and that's where I think we can have even more dialogue, and I hope that we will, okay? Um, so, there's the first slide. Why child welfare? Um, wh when I started in child welfare, I was an 18-year-old child care worker. And um, 
I had this passion for working with people. And of course I had no idea what that meant because I just thought if you worked really hard with people and you helped people that that would be fine, right? And I, and I was part, I worked for, with, um, when I was in high school, I worked for an organization called the Catholic Youth Organization, CYO. Some of you might know that from basketball or they had a lot of kind of sports things, none of which I was involved in. Um, I was involved in like the things where, you know, it was like leadership development and stuff like that. So got involved in that and we started to do all this social justice work um, for all the faults perhaps of the church they always have been a, an organization which did this social justice stuff and because they had their own money they didn't rely on public funds to do it which was really nice because you could do a lot of things that that were interesting and innovative and nobody was monitoring how you use the, those funds specifically it was good and bad so um, I got really involved in working in psychiatric hospitals with um, folks who had psychiatric illness. I knew nothing about that, but they would bring us there and we'd talk to people and some funny things I remember happening because you were completely untrained. I mean, we were like 16 year olds. You're in a psych hospital. I remember this one woman we gave out at Christmas time powder. I don't know why, like talcum powder, you know, you powder on your body. We gave this to the ladies in the psych ward and they all started eating the powder. <laughs> so all of the aides went nuts. Like, don't want to do that. Why'd you get it? And then some of the ladies, you know, were angry that they took away their powder and then they were coming up to us and saying, things which we couldn't understand but basically what they were saying is I'm gonna slap you across the face <laughs> we were like uh, what you know it was really a bizarre kind of experience but I loved it because it was like working with people I had not had experience working with I felt like we were actually doing something good you know we would just talk to people uh, when we were giving them powder um, and and, they, and the other thing that they introduced us to was um, working with kids and I started volunteering at this place called st. Dominic's home in Blauvelt which is kind of in the suburbs of New York City City. I've, I'm a native New Yorker. I've always lived in New York. And um, I thought this was an orphanage. That's what we used to call it when we drove by. Oh, that's the, there's the orphanage. Those poor kids are orphans. And um, I started to volunteer there and thought, my goodness, this is a great experience. I wish I could work in a place like this. And so when I applied for college to work on my BSW um, at the time, um, I started working as an 18-year-old at St. Dominic's Home in Blauvelt um, with kids. Had no idea what I was doing. In those days, we gave no training to people. All of our kids were African-American and Latino. No one told us anything about working with diversity. We didn't even, we didn't even have that word. You know, this is 1976. They didn't even talk about diversity at all. I mean, it was, uh, and the kids would say things like, how come all the staff are white and all the kids are black? I'd say, that's a good question. But I mean, no one said that, nobody in the administration even talked about that. So I, I'm always amazed that in, in some sense, we've come a long way. We've still got a long way to go. But uh, you know, at least at this point, there's some training and stuff. I remember as a childcare worker, I, I took care of 15 little boys, this, you know, six to 13 years old, and uh, who didn't live with their families. They were not orphans, by the way. They all had families. but. We, they had a lot of issues with their families. I remember this one boy coming to me and saying, Gary, can you pick my hair? I had never picked hair in my life. He was African American. And I took that pick and I stuck it at the base of his hair and I pulled up and he screamed. And he said, what is the matter with you? Don't you know how to pick hair? And I said, I don't. And he said, you pick it from the top in. And I thought, how horrible that I'm in charge of caring for this child and I don't even know how to comb his hair. Right? And, and then he, this little boy, his name was David. So, uh, and then he, you know, he would talk to me about, you know, you gotta lotion me up. You know, I got ashy skin, you gotta lotion me up. And I was like, what the heck is that? I mean, I had no concept of any of these things. Our Latino kids would come home from their home visit with these beads around their necks, which we all in the 60s thought were love beads. I don't know if you remember that, I don't know what that means. <laughs> so we would immediately say, oh my God, those are beautiful. And we'd start touching them, and the kid would freak out and say, don't touch my beads, it's gonna take the prayer off them. And we'd say, what? what kind of voodoo is that? Right? We'd say things like that because we didn't know any better and, and it was ignorance. So, but what happened was those were collares that moms gave to their children to protect them from us when they came back to the agency and they would pray or they'd put them in holy water or they would you know, do something that was a spiritual tradition that they would then say to the kid, these are your beads that will protect you, I'll, that will remind you of me when I'm not there and don't let anybody touch them because if somebody touches them it takes the prayer off them. So what a horrible thing, right? We're right away touching them, asking them about them. They also used to drink this little drink called Malta which used to come in a bottle that looked like a Budweiser 
and we'd all say, what the heck is up with these parents giving these kids malt or this drink, it's alcohol? We had no idea. They made pasteles, which are a, a thing, a really difficult thing to make, where you grind up this yuca, yautilla, yame, those are verduras, they call them in Spanish, but they're root vegetables. You make a mash, you put some, sometimes olives in there, or raisins, and, and you wrap it in paper and you boil it, and, and it's a very complicated process. And it, when someone gives you pasteles, it means they really love you. So these parents would send their kids back to the agency after a home visit with this kind of love, and we'd say, what the heck is this? Wrapped in paper, this thing. We had no idea. So I think when I look back at some of the things that initially we did, it was so ignorant and so uncaring and really so you know, not helpful to the children or the families. The families were enemies, too. We, we thought of families as enemies because, again, as an 18-year-old, when you would meet this child, I remember one child had a horrible burn mark, and he had keloids all over his chest because his mother had put him in a hot tub of water because she had mental illness, and she, she was having an episode and put him in the water, and he got burned. But we thought, what a horrible mother. What a horrible person that would put that child in that hot water like that, right? We had no concept of why that happened. Um, there was another little boy who had big marks in his skull. He was six. He was like this big. And his mom's boyfriend had taken nails and banged them into his head. I'm sorry to be so gross so early in the morning, but that was the reality. And, and um, we thought, what a horrible mother. How could she allow that to happen? What boyfriend would be more important than her child? This is horrible. Until I met that mother about two weeks later, and I was serving lunch to the kids, and this was so institutional. I had 15 pieces of bread that I lined up, slapped on a piece of bologna on each of those breads, would say, how many of you want mustard? Raise your hand. How many of you want mayo? Raise your hand. And I would not let them change their mind, because some of them would say, I don't want, I changed my, nope, sorry, can't change your mind, because it was institutional, right? It's like a factory. Mom walks in and says, hi, um, I'm here to visit my son. What's your name? Her name was Mary. She was like this big. And I said, your son, Hector? Yeah. And I said, how old are you? 16 or 17. I'm like, are you kidding? I didn't say this out loud, but 16, she was a child. And, and she wasn't an enemy, she was a child. You know, and, and she loves her son, but she just didn't know how to take care of him at that time. Uh, and, and you know, and, I, and it, at that, that moment was a, a turning point for me in my own thoughts about working with parents. Because she wasn't a horrible person. She was a kid, and her kid was a kid. And she needed to learn how to be a better parent to him. He probably shouldn't have been in a residential treatment program, clearly, but that's what we had in those days. You came into residential care, you, they didn't have foster homes that much. They had some, but not as many. Um, they had an institution, and if you came to the institution when you were six, chances are you left when you were 18. That's horrible, right? So in, in any case, all those things I kind of think made a foundation for some of the work that I later did. I stayed at St. Dominic's for um, about um, two years. I worked with the Dominican nuns, that's where I started, um, and they were not I didn't really like them very much, and they didn't like me very much. Uh, they were these, some of them were great ladies and women who had dedicated their lives to this, and some of them were mentally ill. Um, and they kind of did this because they needed to give them a job. Um, and um, they didn't like me very much. One of the nuns told me one time I was rude and abrasive to the entire order of the Sisters of St. Dominic. And I said, my God, all of them, including the ones in Jamaica, West Indies? And they said, yes, yes them too, and that's what we mean. You're horrible. Um, <laughs> you know, I was 18, right? I thought I knew everything, you know? And I, and I was stupid enough to argue with the nuns, you know? My friend, who is still my best friend, said to me, just shut up, Gary. Just say yes, sister, and move along and do whatever the heck you want. D you know, don't argue with the nuns. You're, you're not going to win. Uh, you know, that was a lesson that took me many, many, many years to learn and sometimes I'm still learning it. Um, so uh, we d I did all that stuff at St. Dominic's. I, we made $3.25 an hour. Uh, that was our pay. Um, most of the, f the staff that worked there at the time were people like me who were either going to college or who had just finished college. It was the 70s, so we were all kind of, you know, all hyped up about, you know, things in a different way than we are now. I mean, we're hyped up about different stuff now, but in, then it was like, you know, we, you know, it was the end of the 60s, and, you know, people were really into different kinds of things, and so most of my colleagues were kind of bachelor-level folks who really thought we were doing something to help children and families, and we were, just we weren't very well trained to do that. Um, 
I slept in three nights a week. That's what we did. We slept, you, got, didn't, uh, you didn't even leave, you couldn't leave, and you didn't get paid. You, at, from 11 to 7 a.m. you didn't get paid, but you couldn't leave. So you had to sleep there with the kids in the agency, but there was no payment. And if something happened at night, well, you know, I had to get up, obviously, and take care of it. And things did happen at night all the time, um, all the time. I mean, these, some of these kids had some serious mental health issues. Many of them were just kids like Hector who, you know, had a mom who was too young to care for him. So, you know, there was a lot of variety there. I learned a lot of interesting things working there. I remember working with um, one woman who was a social worker and um, I was studying for my BSW at the time and she was not the kind of social worker I ever wanted to be. I actually wrote about her, I changed her name to Patty O'Toole. Um, that was kind of like her name, but to protect her confidentiality, she's probably long gone now. She, she, w when we'd go to meetings together, we'd say, uh, Patty, uh, Hector's mom said she'd like to take him home. Ugh, her, she's never gonna get it together. He'd say, okay, Patty, but the mom said she'd really like to take him home for Christmas, and we think it would be a good idea. Ah, she's a drug addict. There's nothing we're ever going to be able to do for her. And I think, this is horrible. And I remember, of course, as an 18-year-old saying, why do you still work here? You obviously hate the kids, you hate the families, and you don't like working here. And she'd say, I'm just here until I can retire. And I would think, oh, please, God, let me never be like that. In because it's time to go when you're like that. Um, because clearly, I don't know, maybe Patty was a great social worker at one point in time, but while I was watching her, not so much. I left St. Dominic's to go to work at St. Agatha's and it was a much more progressive agency. They paid $3.75 an hour. And you only slept in two nights a week and they paid you while you slept. I think 50%, but still better than zero. Um, there I worked with uh, developmentally disabled young people. Only 10 kids, <clears throat> I had 15 before and I was almost always on duty by myself. Fift me and 15 kids and you were on, on duty for like not eight hours, usually like 24 hours straight. So at the end of the 24 hours, you were fried. Um, so, but St. Agatha's didn't allow you to do that. You couldn't be on more than two shifts. You were paid 375. You only had to sleep in two nights a week, and they paid you. And instead of being in a room, because the, the St. Dominic's was like from here to the window. That was it. 15 kids lived in that space. St. Agatha's was like a, a cottage like this. So that was like a paradise. It was like, my goodness, this is incredible. Look at what the kids had their own rooms. And it was really a very different agency. Um, kind of funded the same way as St. Dominic's, but just run differently. Um, I met my daughter there. I, I met a little girl. Her name was Leslie, is Leslie. Uh, she was nine when I met her. She's 50 now. Um, and I, I, I'll tell you a little bit later how I adopted her, but she lived in this program and she was one of, she was a very typical kid. She had developmental disabilities, she had probably Asperger's, although we had no idea what Asperger's was at that time. Um, we didn't know about that, but we, we knew something was different about her. Um, she had been born uh, drug addicted um, and she was surrendered by her mom when she was 12 weeks old at the New York Foundling Hospital. And when she was nine and I met her, she had never in her life lived in a family and she always lived in New York City until she moved upstate and when she moved upstate she was terrified of horses because she thought they were monsters because she had never seen one and she was terrified of grass but she's corrected me recently she said Gary it was not the grass I was terrified I was terrified of the lawnmower I thought it would run me over and chop me up that's what she would say now she remembers so <clears throat> I met her and like nine other kids that I, I was taking care of. And I loved working there. I loved working with developmentally disabled folks. They were just, they were beautiful to work with. Uh, I, again, no training. No, 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 like, let's talk about what it means to be developmentally disabled. No, 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 nothing. I mean, just, you know, here you are, you know, we met once a week, we talked about them, you know, we had a social worker who worked with us who was great, really great, wonderful, and, um, and you know, we just worked with the kids and kind of recreated them and made sure they took their showers and made sure they went to school and dealt with problems when we had problems. We gave out medication all the time, no training. Thorazine, everybody was on Thorazine. <laughs> Not everybody, but like, you know, out of the 10 kids, like four of them were on Thorazine. Um, later in my career, I worked with a very nutty psychologist, psychiatrist, who, who insisted that we all take the medication so we could see what it was like. And of course, you know, being a child of the 60s, I was volunteering immediately. Yeah, I'll take that. <laughs> I'll take the Thorazine. Yeah, let me try the Melorel, you know, of different times, of course. Crazy to do that, but I mean, it actually was useful because you really did. I mean, I took that Thorazine, I literally took it in the morning and I was sitting at my desk and I was like, I, 
I, I couldn't even keep my head up. And it was only like five milligrams. And I had a kid on 200 milligrams twice a day, and he was running around the building. And I thought, my God, he really <laughs> must need to be controlled because five milligrams was killing me. So, but the funny, the funny and not funny thing is, is that we're giving out all this medication, we didn't even know what it was. And, and you know, and, and they, they skip doses, and we give them double dose. I mean, just things that nowadays you'd be put in jail for. I mean, you'd be, you know, they would file charges against you and arrest you. Because it was very different. Um, the structure, the regulations were different. Stayed at St. Agatha's for two years. I finished my BSW degree. I'm ready to be launched into the world as a full-time social worker. Um, I did part of my field placement at St. Agatha's which, with one of the best supervisors I ever had, who's still my friend on Facebook. She's in her 80s and lives in New Mexico, and she's, she's a, she was such a great. The things she taught me, I still do which is so amazing to have somebody who is that good of a supervisor. Uh, and I always remind her of that, you know, because she, she said, you know, nowadays I don't hear that so much, Gary, but I, I do appreciate hearing that I made a difference. Um, left there and then I went to this place called Grace House Youth Center on 108th Street in Manhattan. All of my work was about 30 minutes outside of New York City, which is very suburban. And then I moved back to Manhattan in, uh, I think it was in 2000, uh, no, 2000, it was in 1979. I graduated with my BSW, and I, so I, I, in July, I moved to be the director, believe it or not, at 22, of an agency called Green, uh, Grace House Youth Center. And it was a former convent, so you know I couldn't escape from the nuns. I was back there. They didn't live there, thank God. That would have been really a trip. Um, <laughs> they were gone, and it was an abandoned convent that we took over as a youth center in Harlem. So I went, to, I went there, and I lived there. I lived in the Mother Superior's quarters, which was really funny. Um, and it, we, I ran the these programs, which we would now call youth development programs, for teenagers that lived in Harlem, the East Harlem, the Lower East Side, the South Bronx, um, all of these different, what we then in those days called inner city neighborhoods. And they were kids who were almost predominantly Latino, but also African American and some white kids. No Asian kids, because they didn't come to our programs. And there were very, very few Asian kids ever in child welfare settings. I think we, I had, in my whole career, I remember maybe two children who were um, Chinese who were in care for different reasons culturally. Of course, we didn't talk about it, but we would always say, there's no Chinese kids here, but there was just two. Uh, and at Grace House, it was predominantly Latino. The parents didn't speak any English. So I had to learn how to speak Spanish. So when I went to their home, not to do a home visit because it wasn't that kind of program. It was like kids came, they volunteered. They, it was like they could have been in child welfare, but they lived at home with their moms. Usually no dad, very rarely a dad, although sometimes, but you always a mom. And usually a pretty ferocious mom who protected this kid from whatever was going on in New York City, which is why they weren't in child welfare, because they usually had this mom who was very involved in their lives and really fiercely protective of them. But she didn't speak any English. Uh, I don't even know in those days about undocumented. I'm pretty sure most of my families I worked with probably weren't. I didn't ask. I didn't know. We weren't talking about it. The majority of families were Puerto Rican, who of course are, are U.S. citizens, but a lot of Dominican families from the Dominican Republic, some Mexican, uh, almost everyone spoke no English. So I would go to the family and mom would cook me this phenomenal meal and she'd be talking to me throughout the entire dinner and the kid would be translating. Not a good model. Because the kid would not, I would say to them, I know she just said something, why aren't you telling me that? I'm not telling you that. Because it usually was about them in a negative way. So that's why you don't want a kid to translate for you. Um, so I learned how to speak Spanish and they were not happy, the kids, because it was like, oh, now you can really talk to my mother and she calls you on the phone. And I'm like, yeah, she does. And that's a good thing because she really cares about you and she wants to make sure that she knows what's going on. So I, I stayed there for um, about seven years. I loved working there. It was fabulous. It was a, again, it was part of the Catholic Youth Organization, which I started in. It wasn't really religious. We did retreat kind of things, but it was really youth development. Young people ran the programs. I just was there to help them. Uh, it was a great program. I, I loved being there. Um, really wonderful. Um, and after about um, seven, eight years, it was time to go because it, it was very draining work. You know, you're living and working in a place. It's kind of like being in the Peace Corps, you know. 
it sounds great, but then you're like, wow, I'm exhausted. You know, like you're working seven days a week, people knocking on your door at all hours, and you know, you just kind of needed to have a different bit of a life, right? So um, I left, I got my MSW, one year advanced standing, Fordham University, which was great. I, it was a wonderful experience. I, I, I focused on community organizing and administration, because I'd already done clinical stuff, and of course I thought I knew everything. So you know, what, you know, a BSW clinical practice, I knew it all. Um, and then I learned about CO and admin, and I was running an agency, so I, it was very helpful to do. But after about seven years or so, I left, and I went back into mainstream child welfare. Um, I went to a place called Abbott House, and it was horrible. Um, it was a big institution. It was outside of New York City. It was no longer right in New York. And when I got there, um, the, first, the first thing I didn't do right was I didn't ask for a tour of the facility, because kids lived on grounds, five different units, like 15 kids in each unit. And when I got there, I was horrified. The, 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 the units were filthy filthy dirty. There was no sheets on the beds. The kids were walking around in like boxer shorts or shorts because they didn't have clothes. I kept saying, how could this happen? How You're getting paid to take care of these kids. How would you be allowed to continue to have this here? And I told people this yesterday, and please don't be offended. It's part of the story. But I walked into one unit, and it was so filthy. Uh, it was incredible. And on a big wall like this was spelled out in black spray paint, fuck you. And I thought, kids live here. This is the message, fuck you. And I said to the staff, hey, how did this happen? Well, I don't know. What do you mean you don't know? Don't you work here? Yeah. How, how did this happen? I don't know. I said, didn't one day the wall was blank and another day you came in and it said fuck you and you asked, didn't you ask anybody how that happened? <laughs> no, not really. And I thought, my God, we, this is incredible. So the first thing we did was painted the wall. I mean, literally. And the first thing we did in that agency was clean it up. Buy sheets, buy clothes for kids, buy sofas. I mean, they were sitting on these sofas that were so filthy, you wouldn't let anybody sit on them. You know, they'd be out on the porch, maybe, maybe. So cleaned up, got it going. I stayed there for two years. It was one of those places where I thought, you know what, I've got to get out of here, because if I don't leave, something really bad's going to happen, and then the career will be over. You know, you just kind of had that feeling. We cleaned things up a lot, and um, I actually had one of my social workers bring me to Green, Ch um, Green Chimneys. She told me about this program. And I said, sure, make an appointment, we'll go. Well, when we walked into this agency called Green Chimneys, which is back in Manhattan on 22nd Street, I thought, oh, I like this place. It had a vibe, you know? Uh, you walked in and it was like a beautiful building, it had atrium, and Green Chimneys itself was a, an agency that does this animal assisted therapy in upstate New York, but this program didn't do that. This program was the Independent Living Center for 25 teenage boys between the ages of 15 and 21. So it's like working with teenagers back in the city. I like that. And what I did was as soon as I went home, I wrote to the executive director of the agency and said, very ballsy, I um, went to your agency today. It's clear to me that it's not really run very well. If you'd like to talk to me about how it should be run, please give me a call. <laughs> I was now 30 and still, you know, but I mean, that's 29. But I, I still thought I knew everything, right? So, and, and did things like that. I, sometimes I still do, but I'm smarter now at 60. It's taken a long time. <laughs> and uh, he, he called me and said, you have some nerve talking to me about how my agency's not so good. And I said, it's not, and you know it. And he said, I know. I said, and I know you have a history of running a really good agency. And if you want to do that in New York, well, you and I should talk. And he said, come on up here and meet me. So I went up and met him. And he said, oh, you probably make too much money. And I said, well, you know, I'll tell you what I make. And I made $35,000 in those days. And he said, well, I can't pay you 35. I said, well, what can you pay me? He said, I can pay you 33. I said, I'll take it. 2,000 bucks is no big deal, I can live. You know, so I took the job and I went to work there and I stayed there for 19 years. The funny thing about Green Chimneys that I didn't know was it was this independent living center, which I always think is such a misnomer. No one lives independently. Kids live, you know, people say interdependently, but you know, the real deal is everybody needs a family. So in reality, you know, there is no such thing as independent unless you live in a hut in the woods and you know, you'd never even 
you know, go into town and meet people, right? Even those people have some relationships. But so in any case, and I don't mean to bash people who work in independent living, but I, I've been encouraging folks to change the name for years to life skills or something else or transitioning to adulthood or something that's a bit more descriptive because what independent living means is we don't have to keep track of these kids. They know what they're doing. So again, one of the things I did when I first came to the agency is I would ask staff, how many, I'm sorry to be talking to you, I have to move over here and talk to you too. How many of you, how many kids do we have in this program? And they'd say, um, I don't know, 19? They come and go a lot. I'm like, okay, next person. How many kids do we have in this program? I think 20. Nobody knew. They didn't even know how many kids were there because there were teenagers. We were in New York City. They're pretty mobile. They came and went. But I mean, one of the basic things you need to know if you work in child welfare is how many people you're working with, right? So we did that. We had a big signing in and out board. That was a concrete thing we did. Uh, we changed independent living to life skills for living in the real world. That's what we called it. I wrote a book about it, a whole curriculum from things about taking a shower to, to addressing an envelope. I remember giving an envelope to kids and saying, how would you address this? And they would put all the information over here. And I'd say, really? They never addressed an envelope. Nowadays, nobody even sends letters. But in those days, you did have to send a letter. And there was no internet. Nothing. No. And you know what was really, really a, a huge boom in the field is when we got voicemail. Oh my God, that was like a miracle. No cell phones. Voicemail was like, oh my God, somebody could leave you a message and you could listen to it from home. Later, we of course realized that was horrible, but you know, at the time, <laughs> it was like a boom in technology to have voicemail. I mean, the idea of computers, nobody had a computer. We had, we had secretaries and typewriters. And, and, and when we got an IBM Selectric typewriter, I don't know if you've ever even seen them, with the ball, you know, where it hit the thing and it corrected it. With, that was a miracle. Oh my God, you can correct your, your, your document as you're working on it? I mean, it was a miracle to do that. We had just as much documentation in those days as we do now, but imagine it was written by hand or it was typed by a secretary. Right? All your court notes, all your, all your clinical case consultations, all of that. So we're talking a different world. I also had a telephone that was a dial. No buttons, a dial on my desk. Right? I had a secretary who typed 90 words a minute in one of my programs. She was great. Many of the other ones weren't that fast, but you had to have people who could do those things. Now, nobody, we don't have secretaries anymore. I have an administrative assistant who does things for me. I never, ever ask her to type anything for me. I do it myself. You know, because that's how we do things nowadays. But I mean, you got to kind of think about how different it was administratively, clinically, just in terms of practice. And policy-wise, there was no ASFA. There was no federal legislation. Much of what I'm talking about was before even um, the Adoption um, Act of 1980. Uh, you know, which talked about permanency, which we'll talk about a little later. None of that happened. You know, so you had a whole different system. Um, Green Chimneys was interesting for another reason, too. After being there about five minutes, I realized that of the 25 kids that I could actually identify by the end of the week, six of them were gay, openly gay. And in child welfare, there were no openly gay kids in those days. They were there. No one talked about it. Of course, was no training. Um, you know, if kids engaged in same-sex sexual behavior, we called it homosexual acting out, and it was considered to be just something that happens in residential care. No one ever talked about it. I remember when I first encountered two children engaging in homosexual behavior, like in the middle of the living room during the Carol Burnett show. You know, one night, I. And I talked to them at the treatment team meeting a week later, I wanted to discuss it, and they were like, ah, oh, that's nothing. That happens all the time. Uh, let's talk about something else. And I'm like, don't we need to talk about, like, did I handle it right? You know, is the, I was brand new, didn't talk about it. So when I met these six openly gay kids, 16 to 21, I was shocked. And they immediately said, you know what, Mr. New Director, we need to meet with you because we want to let you know a couple things because we're a group. And I said, okay, I'm happy to meet with you. I'd love to meet with you. Met with them, and they said, first thing is, we live here, we want to continue to live here, and we don't want you to change that. And I said, I have no intention of changing that. I think it's great that you live here. Tell me why you've been able to live here as an openly gay kid. And they said, because the staff treat us with dignity and respect. 
I said, wow, that's incredible. I'm delighted. Well, to give me an example. And they said, well, for instance, I broke up with my boyfriend a couple weeks ago, and I was crying, and I was upset, and I was distraught. And when I went to talk to, you know, Carlene, she sat with me and talked to me, and, and we had tea together. And you know what? I felt better after that. And that's what she would have done to one of these boys who broke up with their girlfriend. But she did the same thing for me, and that made me feel better. And I said, that's fantastic. And I need to talk to Carlene, because that's a great, great thing she did. <clears throat> So we had this conversation. At the end of the conversation, one of the uh, boys said, and I need to come, I need to speak with you after everybody leaves. And I thought, oh, poor thing. You know, he's got some problems, and he wants to talk about it personally, and let's see where he's at with this. So I, he, the, all the other kids left, and Mauricio stayed. Mauricio is now um, my friend on Facebook. He's 48 years old, okay? And we talk all the time. And I probably will talk to him at the end of today and say, I talked about you today, and he loves this. He loves that I still talk about him all these years later. Because what Mauricio said to me was, I've been elected by the group to talk to you, and you know what? We need to tell you something. We know you're a big old queen, and you need to just come out of the closet, okay? <laughs> I thought, what? You know, I was not identifying as a big old queen at the time, and I was married to a woman, and I was not identifying as a person who was gay, and of course I did what every person who's still in the closet does. So I said, oh, you, that's ridiculous, you know, you gay people want everybody to be gay. You know, th that's, that's not who I am. And he said, mm, yeah, sure. <laughs> you know, he was totally confident about it. And it made me go home and I thought, you know, these kids are more confident about who they are than I am. And believe me, I knew what he was saying was true. Um, and and I, I thought, isn't it amazing that this 16, 17-year-old boy living in a group home, not even with their own family, can come to the director of the program and give them that message? And the 30-something-year-old director is still deep in the closet and hiding when the kids are open. And I laugh about it now because it's kind of like, you know, there's this myth that, oh, you know, you can't let gay adults work with gay teenagers because, you know, they might try to change them. And I said, in my, my case, it was the total opposite. The kids, actually, are the ones who made me come out about who I was and I did after later not that afternoon <laughs> not 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 even you know a week later but I did and and it became you know a liberating thing for me as an as a person to be but also I, I always reflect back on that because the thing that I think for me was the point at which I knew I needed to identify as such was when I saw those kids being so brave and I still think about that and think my god you know what what kind of inner strength despite their deficits that they had, did they have to be able to do that? So for me, it's a very, it's a, it's a funny story, it's true, um, but it's also this remarkable turning point in my work uh, and in my life. Um, we then changed that entire program into a program for LGBTQ kids. Um, we didn't have young women live there at the time. We opened supervised apartments for them later. We did programs for runaway and homeless youth, all this stuff. In the end, I had 71 kids in five different programs all around the city. We moved all of our programs to Harlem, which everybody said, why are you doing that? They're going to get beat up. I said, well, do you think I'm stupid enough to move kids to a place where I thought they were going to beat up, get beat up? All these kids are African-American and Latino kids. And we're living in a neighborhood that no one wants us to be in. It was a very Upper East Side neighborhood. I said, not that they shouldn't live there if they want to, but let's live in a neighborhood where everybody can kind of blend in. Because in, in the neighborhood we lived in, as soon as that African-American kid walked down the street, four people said, no, that's a kid from the group home, which was not a good thing for them uh, psychologically and, and in a lot of other ways. So we we moved everything to Harlem. We never had one incident, not one incident of violence towards any of our kids or staff. Uh, we never had a problem. Um, and, and also what it did is made kids, kids tend to sometimes grandstand, so my kids would sit, sit on the group home steps when we were in the Upper East Side neighborhood, and they'd vogue and they'd do, and th they did it on purpose because they knew people in the neighborhood got freaked out about it. So when we moved to Harlem, it was like, I can't, and don't be doing that in the middle of the street. You know, first of all, people will tell you to stop. And secondly, you know, you can do that inside. You don't need to have gr to grandstand about that. Not that it was a bad thing, but just, they, they did, intentionally did it. Actually, a funny story. One of my, there was a car rental place next door to the group home. One of my faculty members from Hunter um, knew the group home. 
and, and she would always say, oh, the kids always sit outside. And I said, yeah. So the kids were all sitting outside one day, and she parked the car to return the rental car, and she bumped into the car behind her, gently. And in New York, people do that all the time. I know in other places in the country that's like not good, but in New York, you always bump in. You have to park, right? It's very tight. So if you bump in, you bump in. So it's nothing. I mean, I, when I go to other places, I have to remember that, because people get really upset. I thought you just had an accident. It's like, it's not an accident. He just bumped in. But this, <laughs> but this kid, knowing that she, she was uncomfortable with them sitting on the porch, said, oh my god, I just saw you bumping into that car. I'm calling 911. And he started making believe he was calling 911. She completely freaked out. And, and then they all started laughing, because he wasn't calling 911. He was just messing with her. But I mean, like, that's the kind of thing they would do with people. It wasn't hostile, horrible. It was just teenage stuff, right? So in any case, Green Chimneys was a great place to work, a great place to do things. I, I finished my doctorate while I was working there. I got a DSW, so I have a MS, BSW and MSW DSW. My dissertation was on the experience of gay and lesbian adolescents in New York City's child welfare system. No one had ever written about that before. I had been told by many of my advisors at school, don't write about this. You will never get a job. No one will ever hire you as a faculty member. You will ruin your career if you write about gay stuff. That's what they would say. Um, and you shouldn't do this. And my other topic was animal-assisted therapy. So they'd say, write about that animal stuff. That's funny. People will like that. You could get a job. But if you write about the gay stuff, you're never going to get a job. And I just thought, really? So my advisor, who was a, a wise man, said, you know what, Gary? Don't listen to people. Do what you think you're passionate about. And you know what? This will not destroy your career. This will make your career. And he was absolutely right. He was a straight man, knew nothing about gay stuff, actually was kind of uncomfortable about it. As we were doing my dissertation, I would realize, he said to me one day, he lived in my neighborhood, and he said to me, I got to tell you something. I, and he would run in the park, and so would I. We didn't run together, but we passed each other. He said, I, I got to tell you something. I said, what? He said, I saw you in the park the other day. I said, oh, really? You know, why didn't you say hi? And he said, well, because I saw you, and you looked at a guy who, who ran by, and you gave him that kind of look. And I said, like what? And he said, you know. And I said, oh, like he was hot? <laughs> and he said, yeah, I guess so. But it was like he was so uncomfortable. He said, it made me feel really uncomfortable. I said, Erwin, don't you ever look at women that you think are attractive? And he said, yeah, I guess so. But I just don't think I ever saw a guy do that to another guy. And I was like, you know, welcome to the world of gay people. You know, <laughs> it was nothing. But for him, it was. And I, I appreciated him telling me. I didn't think it was a microaggression or anything. It was just, you know, he was being honest. And it's no big deal. But I, I realized he, he wasn't that comfortable with the topic. But he was a great advisor, brilliant editor, great guy. He just turned 80 the other day. Um, and he retired. Um, but a really wonderful person who really helped me fashion this work in a way that I wouldn't have been able to do. He also kept telling me, Gary, this, this can be a book. And I'm like, Erwin, I just want to get my dissertation done. I don't care about a book. I never thought it could be a book. And he's like, no, 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 this could be a book. So by the time I finished my dissertation, I had a book contract with Columbia University Press to turn it into a book. So I, I kind of at this point started to think about leaving um, direct practice, and I went to academia. I, I, because I got my PhD, my D, DSW, I thought, let me, let me, maybe I should start teaching about this. I always had a passion for teaching. I wanted to do that. So um, I, when I finished my DSW, I got a. I worked at Hunter as an adjunct, so I was doing that. But they didn't like to hire people who were from their program, and I knew that. That's a lot of PhD programs don't want to hire you if you come from their program. You got to go somewhere else. Uh, I worked there briefly, and then all of a sudden, one day, I got this call from Columbia University, and they said, we'd like to interview you. We have several jobs, and we'd like to interview you. And I thought, my god, I must be fantastic. <laughs> Columbia University? I couldn't even afford to go there. <laughs> Wants to hire me? And I went there, and they hired me, and I was really pumped up. Like, I'm, I'm a faculty member at Columbia University. I'm a professor at Columbia. I mean, I felt, I mean, I'm a working class, even lower than that, person whose mother and father didn't even graduate from high school, who nobody in the family ever went to college. So I, I met a famous professor, and she was telling me about all the famous faculty members in her family. And I said to her, she said to me, and what about your family? What did they do? I said, retail and maintenance. I mean, literally. My mother, you know, was a retail worker, and my father worked as, as a custodian. So, I mean, going to Columbia? Oh my God, I thought it was great. I was there five minutes and it was like, oh, I got it. They don't really want me as me. They want a gay person, a black person, a Latino person, and, um, an Indian. 
They had one of each. Karina Walters was one of them. <laughs> she was the Indian. Daryl Wheeler was the black guy. I was the gay guy. And Claudia Moreno was the Latina. And, and, and one other woman. She was biracial, adopted, and she was dark skinned, but spoke with a Scottish accent. So she really threw them off. We're, we're very good friends. <laughs> She's back in Oklahoma where she came from. By the end of three years, every one of us left because it was clear that really why we were invited to come was to represent this diversity that was false. Um, all of us worked in those areas, too. We, we, I wrote about gay people. Daryl wrote about African-American people. Um, Karina wrote about Indians. You know, Claudia wrote about Latina people. I mean, we all wrote about those areas. And they wanted us for that. And, you know, and the, it wasn't like we had great pay. It just was, it was prestigious to be there. Right? It was very prestigious. Um, and then um, I kept talking to Hunter College and saying, um, you have any jobs? Because I'd really like to come back here. I've been at Columbia. And they were like, really? You want to come back to Col Hunter? Yes, I needed to come back to Hunter. Hunter was, is a public university with 67% of our students are diverse people. There's like 130 languages that our students speak. I mean, it's a very different. We have 1,300 students in our MSW program. So it's a big school. Now we do. We used to have like 600, but that's still big. And um, I was dying to come back there. And uh, they, they, I interviewed. They hired me after you know uh, the interview process. And I, I've been there for 25 years. I love being at Hunter. It's a fabulous place to be. It's not perfect, but it's a wonderful, wonderful school. And it's a, I, I've never ever had the slightest breath of hesitation from any colleague about being gay or writing about gay issues or writing about the things that I feel passionate about. It, it's been a really wonderful experience. After about a year of being a faculty member, I became the executive director of the National Center for Foster Care and Permanency Planning, which is part of the Child Welfare Children's Bureau in Washington, D.C. And that was a really great opportunity. I got to go out to all over the country. I've been here like five times. And I worked with people at DCFS here on permanency and concurrent planning. Planning. We did technical assistance and training in a wide range of areas as it related to foster care. So going out to talk about this was like a dream come true because I had spent my whole life doing it. I did practice, I did policy, I did research, and now I got an opportunity to meet with real people and to try to help them to do what they did better for children and families. And so it was a great, wonderful experience. I did that for, I think, 14 years I was the director. And then it changed. They, the, the federal government decided decided to change it to a, a different system where it was a bigger um, states organization. I chose not to work with them because at that point I had traveled everywhere and I was exhausted to be really honest with you. I mean, I, I traveled sometimes in one week to five different states and did five different things, like keynoted at a conference, worked with them on concurrent planning, uh, wrote policy with them. It, it was exhausting. It was fun, but you, you know, when, you're as, when you're in this field and you do good things, even though it's good, it, it can be really tiring. And you need to, I learned, I needed to stop saying yes because I kept saying yes and there was times when I wasn't that good. You know, and, and, you, and I knew that. So it's like, I got to stop because I'm, I've re reached my max threshold of being able to do the things I need to do. I, I hope I wasn't not good a lot of times. I think a couple of times maybe I wasn't, and I'll, I'll be honest. Um, when that ended, um, uh, we had a lot of, pro we had a, you know, schools are full of drama. And our school had a dean that was a good dean for five years, and then she wasn't a good dean. And so the president of the college wanted her to leave. I'm being honest with you. And um, we encouraged her to leave, and she didn't want to leave. And then she got really encouraged to leave, and she did. Um, and that's, you know, you serve at the pleasure of the president when you're the dean. It, it doesn't matter if everybody loves you or not. It helps, but you serve at the pleasure of the president. And, uh, and, and most deans last for about eight or nine years, and that's it. Then you, you either go back to being a faculty member, or you go on to another deanship, or whatever. A lot of people, Darrell Wheeler, who I'm speaking about, who's a friend, he left Hunter where he was. He came to Hunter, too. Left there, went to... Um, Chicago, where he was an associate dean, went to Albany, where he was assistant provost, and now is in Iona College, where he's a provost. So he met a lot of academics go to many places. Uh, I never wanted to move anyplace else. I'm a native New Yorker. My, my friends and my family were there, and I, I needed to be there, and I wanted to be there. So um, when, when the dean left, um, the president met with me and the, another woman and said, which one of you will be the dean? And I said, at that point, I was... 57 years old, and I said, not me. 
I'm not doing that. I don't want to work 12 months a year. I like being off in the summer. I don't want to deal with all this drama. You know, it's a, it's a lot of work. Uh, I like to work hard, but I like to do what I want to do. I don't want to do, you know, all this stuff. And my colleague said, I'll be the dean. And I said, good, you be the dean, and I'll be the associate dean. And that's how I became the associate dean. Literally. And not that I wanted that. I never aspired to being that. I just wanted to help my friend who was going to be the dean. And to be honest with you, I wanted to make sure she wanted to be the dean because I didn't want to be the dean. I wanted her to be the dean. And I knew the default plan was, OK, if she's not going to do it, Gary's going to do it. I, I didn't want to do that. I did want to be the dean at one point, And I did apply to be the dean at the Tulane School of Social Work in, in Louisiana. I do a lot of work in Louisiana, in New Orleans. I love Louisiana. And I was the finalist, along with one other guy. I was this close, and I didn't get the job. And to be honest, that was really painful really hard because you you're like okay I have all the things they need and to get that phone call it says I'm really sorry but we're not we're not going with you we're going with the other candidate it's like oh it really hurts but you know that's the way it is when you have a career you know some things you get and some things you don't and you know they they went with somebody who is much more NIH National Institute of Health research oriented because they needed to bring money to the university that's a big thing in universities I've raised 38 million dollars for Hunter but they really you know they wanted a different kind of research for that school so that's who they hired um, so I became the associate dean of research and scholarship and now I work with faculty I help them get grants I help them write grants. I meet with them at lunch and say, gee, you only have two publications and you've been here for four years. That's not so good. You know, a part of being promoted and in tenure and in academia is you got to write. You know, publish or perish, that's really true. You know, and how many? It's not a magic number, but it's, here is the magic number. Two or three a year, at least. Two or three articles in a peer-reviewed journal a year. It's a lot of work, right? So you gotta really work with people to give them the support they need. Our faculty have got that support. They teach one course a semester for five years. That's it. And then they can be free and do their research. So, and they get paid in the summer, even though they don't work in the summer. There's a lot of benefits to when junior faculty come to help support them and do it. So, so that's what I'm doing now. Um, I, my dean became the permanent dean. They had a search. And then she became the permanent dean. And we were all thrilled about that. And then she said to me, you're not leaving, right? And I'm like, uh, no, I'm going to stick with you. Because I was promised to stick with her until she became the, uh, the full-time dean. So uh, yeah, I'm going to stay. But I'm not positive what I'm going to do. You know, I'll stay with you. I have no plan on leaving. I'm not leaving Hunter. If I leave Hunter, I'm retiring. So that's why I put winding down the career, because that's the real deal. You know, I turned 60 this year. Um, I've worked in this field for 43 years. That's a lot of work. I started really young. And there are days when I absolutely love every second of what I do, and there are other days when I'm tired. That's the reality. You know, and I think I, I work with colleagues who are still working in their 80, and they shouldn't. But they do. And it's their choice. But you know, it, I don't think that you are the current anymore when you're at a certain point. I mean, I was teaching a class on clinical practice one day, and I said <laughs> something to the class about, oh, yeah, DSM-5 and the five-axis diagnosis. And I'm going on and on and on. And one little brave student said, oh, Professor Mellon, there's no more five-axis diagnosis. And I'm like, OK, that's a mistake because you just get out of practice, right? Um, and I said, I'm sorry, you know, well, how many axes are there now? There's two. Oh, okay. Axis one is presenting problem, axis two is personality disorder. I knew that, but I, I was a little bit thrown by the fact that there were no longer five. Um, so you realize, well, you know, I need to start thinking about where do I want to go next? What do I want to do next? I don't want another job. I, I love child welfare, but I don't want to keep working in child welfare. I'd like to actually grow plants, um, really. Um, and I'd like to, I, I love dogs. I'd like to raise dogs. You know, <laughs> different, right? Uh, I've, I volunteered at a shelter for dogs, and I loved it. Nobody knew who I was. I just walked the dog, you know. It was great. Um, so you realize when you've built this career, and it's been all in child welfare, that, you know, what's, what's the time at which you also need to say, okay, I need to close this up a bit or slow this down a little bit and I need to say this is as far as I need to go. Um, 
it's probably too much information to share, but I have a very young husband that I got married to two, two years ago, and he's brilliant and smart and lovely, and he'll say things to me sometimes like, but it'll be really good for your career, and I'll say, honey, the career is coming to an end. I, I'm not worried about one more article or one more thing, and he's like, no, but it really would be good for your career, and I just kind of laugh to myself and say, Oh, it's okay. You know, it, it is what it is. I'm very happy with what I did. I, I loved what I did. I hope that you all love one day as much child welfare and what you've done as, as I have. I, I don't also, I never saw it as a stepping stone either. Like, oh, I'll do this for a couple years and then I'll leave. A lot of people do. Oh, I'll take that four week thing that they gave me for free and then I'll stay my two years and then I'll leave. You know, I hope you don't. I mean, I hope you stay for 30 or 40 years and that you like it and that you feel like what you're doing does make a difference and that you're competent and that you, you still are making a difference in the lives of children and families. I think the greatest thing that's happened to me recently is Facebook. I know it's kind of old, right? But I, I, I'm friends with all these kids that were my kids in care. And they all tell me about their lives. You don't get that chance. I mean, the 48-year-old Mauricio, you know, I knew him when he was 19 or 20. He's 48. He tells me about what he's doing in his life. And it's very gratifying to know, number one, he's still alive. And number two, he's actually doing well. He's married. He has a family. He has a nice house in Maryland. You know, he has crazy drama like we all do in our lives. But he's, he's happy. And he's doing good. And that makes me feel really good. I told people yesterday, too, my dog died right before I came here on Wednesday. Um, Wednesday, I had to put her to sleep. She was nine and a half. And it was really sad, but it was kind of like I didn't have time to be sad. I was just coming here. But I put it on Facebook because, of course, we all announce everything on Facebook, right? <laughs> we do, right? The death of Frida is all over Facebook now. Her name was Frida. And um, one of my former kids wrote me this really sweet note that said, I bet you're feeling sad today, and look what they're doing in San Francisco. He lives in San Francisco. They're renaming this street after Frida, just like your dog. And I thought, how sweet, right? You know, to, to think of another person. I hope I don't get emotional. Um, I didn't plan on that. Um, that somebody, you know, who you helped years ago is still thinking, you know, oh, let me give something back to them. You don't, you don't get that. So, I mean, to, to have that connection with, with, young, with young people who are now adults is a real gratifying experience. So that's the career, you know? That's kind of where it was. That's kind of, yeah, go ahead. Um. First off, thank you. You're a very passionate speaker, and you can tell that you really and I'm sweating. Things done. Um. So it's really it's really good for us to hear, um, especially as young professionals. Um, good. I mean, I've been in the child welfare field for three years, and you already run into people that are so burnt out. And yeah. Have such a negative perception. Yeah. You can really tell that you have really kept like your good spirits and really kept everything at that social work value of strength based. Mm -hmm. um, so I just was wondering if you could speak a little to how you kept that through that, a That's a great question. And you know what? There were peaks and valleys. That, that's the honest. I never wanted to leave. I never like applied to law school and tried to do that, or I never tried to leave. But there were moments when it was like, this is hard, and I'm exhausted, definitely. But I'll tell you what helped. I, um, I took vacations regularly. I, I wasn't one of those people that never went on vacation. Like every four months, I took a week off because I needed a break. Um, and I would go someplace fun, or maybe sometimes I just stayed home. But I just, I, I very much thoughtfully took a break. Uh, in the beginning, I didn't do that. I worked every holiday. I never took off. And you burn out. Uh, I worked like way too much. I worked on the weekends. And then I realized, wait a minute, let me take a little break. That helps. I went to the movies a lot even by myself. I still do. I love going to the movies. I mean, I saw, um, I went to the movies this week. Well, I saw I, Tonya, which I loved. Um, it was a great movie. I saw Lady Bird, fabulous. I saw all the movies that got nominated. But what did I go to see this week? I went to see something by myself. Oh, I went to see um, Black Panther, um, which was really interesting. My partner didn't want to go, and he was studying for school. I'm like, I'm going, and I went by myself. It, it, it makes you escape. Right? Nowadays, we stay home and watch Netflix, right? But you know, you're in your sweat clothes and you got food all over you. After a while, it's like, I gotta get out of the house. I gotta go. I don't care if it costs $14 to go to the movies. I'm also now, which I'm thrilled about, I go to the movies and I get the senior discount. <laughs> It's like two dollars less, but I'll, I'll say. And, and the other day, I was annoyed. I saw "Call Me by Your Name," which I loved. I saw it so crazily three times, but I loved it. So I, I said to the guy at the booth, um, "Well, I'm supposed." To, he said fourteen dollars, and I said, "Okay, I'm supposed to get the senior discount." And he said, uh, "I know, I already gave it to you." I'm like. Damn you. you know, I, I, thought, I thought I looked pretty good. I like when I have to tell them and they're like, oh, really? I'm like, yeah, but it's okay. 
<laughs> but Black Panther was cool. It's very escapist. It's very interesting. Um, Call Me By Your Name was this brilliant movie. I loved it. Uh, I loved it for very personal reasons. You know, it's, it's a movie about kind of the first time somebody falls in love and you're infatuated with this person. And it's just, if you haven't seen it, go see it. It's a beautiful movie. Um, it's done by an, a director called Luca Guardanaro. He's an Italian um, director, and he's done two other films that he said this was the last of the th trilogy. Of course, I watched the other two films, and I don't see why they're a trilogy, except they're all about desire and passion. They are. But this last one is, you know, this 17-year-old boy who falls in love with this 24-year-old doctoral student, doctoral student of his father's in Italy. And it's not a gay movie. It, it is a movie about two guys who fall in love, but I wouldn't call it a gay movie. Uh, and it's filmed in Italy, and oh my gosh, it's just beautiful. And they have beautiful music. I don't know if you know Sufjan Stevens. So what's, how do you say his name? Sufjan Stevens. Sufjan I, I bought his album. I mean, you can tell I'm obsessed, right? So I was like, <laughs> I, uh, because it's beautiful music. And um, so it's a really, it's a wonderful escape. That's what I did. I escaped. Um, I also had, you know, good people in my life. The, my closest friend in the world, who is currently on a cruise, um, is 66 years old. We met when she was 25 and I was 18 as a child care worker at St. Dominic's. We like have dinner every single Sunday together. She's like my family. And, and she and her sister, uh, who are women, they're not, they're not lesbians, and they ne but they never married, and they live together, they're my family. I mean, I have a sister and three brothers. I see them occasionally, but those two are my family. So I created family, right? I, I created people who I needed to be around, because my brothers are New York City police officers, and they're horrible. I mean, their politics is like, oh my God, really? I can't go to Thanksgiving at their house anymore. I have a black daughter, a Latin husband, and we're gay. I, I can't deal with, <laughs> with the, the ugliness at the table, you know? And it was really ugly when Obama was president. And I was just like, I can't sit there anymore. And they all call me and say, why don't you come to Thanksgiving? I'll, and I'll say, I just can't do it anymore. I love you all, but I can't come anymore. So I go to Nancy and Laura's house. And we all, my husband, my daughter, and other friends, you know, we all have a fabulous time at dinner, and it's lovely. But I did that. I escaped that way with family that I created. Sometimes my own family, I mean, and, 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 and my own creative. I had good colleagues, too. Last night, I talked for an hour and a half on the phone with my dean. And we talked about work, but we also laugh about stuff. Laughing is very important, and having humor. I think what's happened in social work, and I'm so, it's, just, it's not just social work, it's what happened in the world. We've become so serious about everything, you know? I mean, I really miss being able to have a little sense of humor, I mean, about things. And I know even with the whole Me Too movement and some of the absolutely important things that have had to be brought out and discussed, but also, it's made you like this. Right? I mean, we, I met a new faculty member that we hired, and I said to her, oh, we're so happy that you're coming. Congratulations. Can I have your permission to hug you? <sighs> you know, it's not sexual, but I mean, now you have to say that. Right? You can't say to colleagues anymore, oh my god, I love your sweater. <gasps> what do you mean? It's like, oh wow, things have changed dramatically. I think that's, it's good because it needed to. And I, and I think the whole, just to comment about the Me Too thing, I'm not in any way putting it down. Every woman has experienced sexual harassment, usually by men. Every woman, in every field, and some way worse than others. But there's also a lack of, 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 of opportunity to be natural and authentic and warm. And then we've lost that in the mix. So it's not just the Me Too thing. It's, it's other things, you know. It's about microaggressions, right? I mean, people will tell me sometimes, oh my god, I feel like I've been microaggressed. I'm like, do you think your clients are microaggressed? I always ask that. You know, do you think that woman at 6 o'clock in the morning with her three kids walking across the street feels microaggression every day? Because a lot of times it becomes all about us. Important, important that we know who we are, but I think that kind of thing wears you out too. I, I go to social work conferences sometimes, I'll read what people are presenting, I don't even understand it anymore. I mean, that's part of, you know, the last part, time to go. Because, you know, you can't keep saying it's, you know, the, oh, it used to be like this. You know, 20 years ago we did this. You know, things do change over time, and you have to be able to step back and say, okay, I, I recently um, had two colleagues who did a special issue on LGBTQ issues, and I, I would like to talk about that a little bit in a minute, and um, they kept wanting to call it SOGI. 
sexual orientation, gender identity, expression. And I kept saying, guys, if you call it that, no one will know what that means. But they're, you know, cutting edge academics and professionals in that field. And I had to shut up because I realized I was sounding like an old man. And I just said, okay, if you want to call it SOGI, call it SOGI, but you, you need to define it. And you need to understand that people in Alabama and Arkansas and Louisiana and Mississippi, where I work, won't understand that. So you kind of have to keep saying gay, lesbian, bi, trans, or queer, which they don't understand either, but it's, it's you know, people know that. Or L LGBTQ, you need to say that too. And they came up with this brilliant two-volume issue of child welfare that's coming out soon. I was so impressed. They were, young, they were young professionals who wrote for this. That The first article I wrote in 1992, 26 years ago, no one else wrote about it. I don't feel jealous. I'm thrilled. I didn't need to be part of it. I wanted them to be part of it, so you need to also know how to, at certain points, step away and let people take the lead. Uh, you know, at, in the beginning that hurts because you're like, wait a minute, I'm, 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 wait a minute, I did that. And you have to just shut up and let other people, and you'll see uh, uh, yourself in your own careers, you know, when you're very young, it's great that people are paying attention to you and you're the lead. And at a certain point, they stop making you the lead. So you have to kind of be ready to, you know, deal with that. And it's not a bad thing. It's just a natural progression of life. So, but great question. Can I sure, you can ask whatever you want. Okay. Um, so, I just do want to say that I work second shift, and after upper management leaves, we definitely get that humor back. Yes. So that's very nice. Which is good. Um, but you mentioned that you know things are changing, and that's something you're noticing. But a lot of what you said when you were going over um, just your career history are things that are still very present. You yeah. Know, the oh yeah. Social worker. Yep. I mean, just last week, I heard someone say on the phone to a professional, "This mom's never going to get better." Yeah. And I'm like, that's just not what you want. No. Um, or, or, or saying, you know, the mom's a drug addict. Yeah. Oh, horrible way to talk. I always say, if that was your mother and you were in the room, would you want them to say that about your mother mm -hmm. or your sister? You wouldn't. Yeah. And the interesting thing I thought was that you moved, I um, think it was Green Chimney, to Harlem from mm -hmm. Manhattan. And I think that is such an important thing that isn't, that is almost getting bypassed at this point in child welfare just yeah. because. Um, you know, obviously we don't, you know, race match in our placements and no. things like that anymore. And that's good because we don't want kids lingering in care. But I think so many of our kids in care are minorities and then they're getting placed in these homes where they are the token black kid or the yep. token Latino. And I think that we need to do better as, yeah. in the child welfare with that culture. Yep. So I think that's cool that You're that's right. Cool. And you know what? I got a recommendation for you because I am a professor, so I give out readings. Mm -hmm. There's a guy named John Rabel, R-A-I-B-L-E, who is at the University of Nebraska. He's, a, he's not a social worker. He writes passionately and wonderfully about what it feels like to be a transracial child who was adopted and grows up in a white family. He also presents on it. He might also at some point be a good presenter for you to come. R-A-B-L-E? R-A-I-B-L-E. John Rabel. And I think he has a website too, like johnrabel.com. But look him up on the University of Nebraska first. Uh, you know, he, he, grew, he was adopted. He's transracial. He grew up in a white family in a very white neighborhood. He used to come home to his family and say, look, kids in school are teasing me. And they would say, oh, stop being so sensitive, John. Nobody's teasing you. Come on. <laughs> don't matter, which he said <coughs> was worse than if he had not gotten any kind of empathy because it meant that people didn't believe him. So when he was saying this, it was more painful. So, I mean, I, I think MEPA, Multi-Ethnic Placement Act, and then IEPA, which is the Inter-Ethnic Placement Act, are two of the worst pieces of legislation that have ever been passed. And now that I don't work for the federal government anymore, I can say that. Because when I did, I couldn't say that. They're horrible. And I really had hoped that during Obama's administration, somebody would have said, get rid of these two legislations. The idea that African American children were not placed in families in an expeditious way because we were waiting for a black family is really not true. Okay? And it's a matter of recruitment. Okay? So from MEPA, Multi Ethnic Placement Act, you can't go out and say, I've got 15 African American children who need 15 African American families. You can't say that. It's, it's against the civil rights law. But you can go to a community that is an African-American community and say, we've got children who need families. Are you interested in being a family for that child? Different recruitment. 
You're not talking about race, okay? They don't like when we do that, but it's not illegal to do it. You can't th say, oh yeah, I'm the QT, you know, I'm not supposed to, you can't do that. But, and I, I've seen people acknowledge in front of the civil rights people that they do that in a meeting at the Children's Bureau. And I thought, oh my God, they're gonna arrest them. They'll, not, they won't, but I mean, they're, they're, gonna, they're gonna do something to that state because you're not supposed to do that. It's a very serious piece of legislation. But, you know, I, I have an African-American daughter. Do I think I was a competent parent? Sometimes, you know, I, and sometimes no. Will I know what it's like to be an African-American person? No, I don't. I never will. I know a lot, but I never will. So, you know, what she did, you know, is, you know, she, we lived in neighborhoods where she wasn't the only kid. We, she went to schools where she wasn't the only black kid. You know, I, I didn't even try to do her hair, because that's, I can't. I mean, I can't braid, and, you know. She, we, she went to places that did know how to do that, and that's a big part of her life. She'll tell me, oh, I came back from, the, from getting my hair done. And about every other week, she has very long locks, like down to here, and she's very proud of them. These are not fake. These are all mine, <laughs> you know. So she's really into that. But again, I wasn't a perfect parent. I was good for her at the time. She had developmental disabilities. No, nope, and no. Nope, my point with her was nobody was bringing her into their family, uh, and it was in the you know the 80s, you know. Um, but she and she's done well. But I'm I'm not black, and and I will never understand what it means to walk in a room and to be perceived as a black man. I'm not. So she does every day. So we, you know, it, it's, it is inadequate to some extent. I don't think you can, you love that person less, but you don't understand the experience. My two sons are Latino, but they've completely rejected their Latino heritage, you know, because they grew up in this white family where I was Irish and my partner at the time was Italian, and they would say, we're Irish and Italian, right? And I was like, no, you're Mexican. No, I'm not. Yeah, well, you are. I don't want to be Mexican. You know, Mexican people jump over the wall and, you know, all these negative stereotypes, which is horrible, right? We brought them to Texas where they were born and we brought them to Mexico and you know what their comment was? Thank God I was adopted. Oh my God, I'd be selling chiclets on the street in Tijuana. It's like, no you wouldn't. That was not why we brought you here, but that was what they got, right? So since then, they both took Spanish in school, hated it. Since then, they've both found their moms, which we helped them do, and their moms don't speak a word of English, which I kept saying to them, don't you think at some point, yeah. No, you know what, they're real smart. They write to them and run it through a translator. They don't even want us to help them because it's their message, which they shouldn't. They run it through a translator. Um, so it, I always feel badly. I, I, I think they've lost their ethnic identity. You know, um, a Travis at one point said he was not Latino, he was black. I was like, well, no, you really are Latino. No, I'm black. And he wanted a black therapist, and he only wanted to listen to the black radio station, and he had all this stuff about being black. <laughs> and then one day he switched back, and it was okay to be Mexican. You know, so but, I mean, part of that's the identity formation that kids go through anyway. Adopted kids go through it in a whole different way. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of stuff. I mean, if you're going to adopt a child or be a foster parent to a child who is of a different race than you are, you better be prepared to make some changes in your own life. And it's not just about hair care, that is an issue, but it's about are you willing to live in a neighborhood where you're the minority and your kid isn't? Are you willing to go to a church or a synagogue where everyone doesn't look like you, but your kid feels comfortable? Stuff like that, people don't, aren't. Also, just one word about adoption. Adoption is about finding the right family for the kid, not about finding the right kid for a family. That's the big thing that we've got to struggle with, right? We've got adopted people who are like, I'd like to adopt, but I want this kind of child. Well, we don't have that kind of child. You know, but, it, but, but we have a child who's like this who needs this kind of family. And a challenge. Adoption's a challenging piece. Foster care is hugely challenging. I mean, my, uh, Leslie was my foster child before I adopted her. She was an easier foster child because she never lived in a family. She did crazy things when she came to live with me. Crazy. Met a man on the subway. She was 16. Met a man on the subway and invited him home because she needed a boyfriend. She didn't even know his name. I mean, when I walked in the apartment and I saw this man in my apartment, I said, who are you? She invited me here. I'm like, you need to leave. And I said to her, like, you know, what the hell is going on? <laughs> oh, he followed me home. I said, how could that be? We have a doorman, you have a key, and he's in the apartment with you. He didn't follow you home. What really went on? I decided I needed a boyfriend, Gary, and I invited him home. 
I said, and then what happened? We got home and he said, come on, let's get busy. Because that's what he thought he was being invited there for. And had I not walked in, maybe that would have happened, right? So, but this is first week living at home. I really felt like saying, you're going back to the group home. This was a mistake. And uh, believe me, friends and family said, you were crazy. See, why did you do that? You're crazy. You shouldn't have done that. My own mother would say constantly, anytime we had a problem with our kids, you don't know where they came from. They could murder you in the middle of the night, Gary. I'd say, Ma, really? And she'd say, well, you, you, know, you don't know them. I'd say, we've raised them. And she would, you know, in our family, you would know them. I said, Ma, your sister jumped off the bridge and your brother got burned in a fire. Are we perfect? You know, we had a lot of alcoholism, mental health problems in our, you know, perfect family. I said, you know, come on, we've all got problems, but I don't think that's the issue. But, but families don't always support those, those decisions either. Um, partially because they're protective and they love their person, but still, it's, it's not helpful when you hear those things. But that's a great question, too. Anyway, where, how are we doing for time? I'm completely lost. <laughs> okay, good. So let's talk about themes. Okay, um, these are these are some some things that are happening currently in child welfare. Child welfare is a big cycle, cyclical nature of child welfare. Okay, we don't want kids in group homes. We want kids in families. Okay, kids really shouldn't be, you know, there. They should be in 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 this kind of program. Nope, kids should be in group homes. Nope, that kid got killed, so now they need to go in this program. Okay, now we need to take kids away. Nope, nope, don't take kids away anymore. We need to get them it's round and round and and part of that's about politics let's be honest right um, most child welfare programs are they're administered by the federal government through the Children's Bureau that comes down to the state and then in many states like I think here in Wisconsin it's a county administered program is, am I right so the county or the locality makes the rules based on what they've been told from the state and the federal government by law but they they tweak them right so every place got a different thing going on. And I'll give you an example. In New York City, big program, big. When I started in child welfare many years ago, 60,000 children were in child welfare in New York City. Now, 12,000. That's hugely different. But they change the name of the organization all the time. We were the Bureau of Child Welfare. One night it became the Special Services for Children. Then one other day it became the, the Child Welfare Administration. And then another day it became the Administration of Children's Services. They kept changing the name because all these lawsuits kept getting filed against them. And then that was an issue, right? The, the, the lawsuit, like here in Milwaukee, they went into receivership. So some organization takes over the system. So you just see this cyclical nature, and it's very political, right? In New York City, we had a mayor called Mayor Giuliani, who was good and bad. He was good in a lot of ways, and he was horrible in other ways. Um, and he uh, wanted to um, have a, um, a mission statement for the administration of children's services. And people were saying, you know, sophisticated things like, safety for all children. All children are safe. And he said, how about this one? No dead kids. Because, as a politician, when any kid got killed in the system or who was known to the system, it was in the newspaper constantly. The, they were challenged in, in the court sometimes. And the administration was told, you need to fire the commissioner. We had, I can't tell you how many commissioners. Because everyone got fired. And every time one gets fired, they change what the last one did. So you've got this, this nature that's just in the system of every time a new person comes along, they want to completely eliminate what the old person did and put their stamp on what they do. It's just, again, politics and nature of the beast. And the middle folks all stay there. So you're like, oh gosh, now we have to do this? Oh, that, that person's gone, now it's a new thing. Like in New York, they were very into evidence-based practice because that commissioner was into it. He left, the new one came, she said, I'm not into this evidence-based practice stuff. We're into uh, family group conferencing. She did a really nice job and guess what happened to her? Kid got killed, she went on the news and she started crying. At first she said, kids get killed in child welfare all the time. Mistake, big mistake. <laughs> then they attacked her in the press then she went in a news conference and burst into tears and started crying, and then she resigned the next day because she needed to be with her family more. 
please, right? <laughs> Listen, no, we know that's not true. But I mean, and, and she was a good person, a really good woman. And of course she felt horrible about what happened. And isn't it okay to express emotion sometimes? But not in the media, not when you're the commissioner, I guess, right? So it all changed. We got a new guy from Washington. He got rid of all the stuff that she did, and now there's a whole bunch of new stuff. I'm just giving you one example, right? There are changes in the federal government, obviously, I think you all know that, right? The Obama administration was very different from this current administration. And even in the Obama administration, we didn't do that much stuff in child welfare, but they did have a commissioner who did two things. Bless you. His name was Brian Samuels. He was the head of the Children's Bureau, and he started talking about well-being. That's big and different. And he started talking about LGBTQ issues and how that impacted on children and families. Two big changes. But he left, and then the new person came, and they still had the LGBTQ on the table, and the well-being stuff kind of started to fall off a little bit. It's still there, but it started to kind of deteriorate a little bit, right? Um, but they were pretty big changes, but not major legislative changes, okay? They have a new head of the Children's Bureau. His name is Jerry Milner. Um, he was the commissioner in Alabama, great guy. He worked at the Children's Bureau many years ago, and he is the mastermind for designing the CFSR process. Any of you know about that? You do, of course, right? The Children and Family Service Review, where they're monitoring an accountability system. He masterminded the initial development of that plan. After Jerry and his colleague Will Hornsby left, everybody started chipping it away, chipping it away, chipping it away. Bless you. And then it got to a point where it was like, okay, maybe we're not going to do the CFSR anymore. Maybe we're going to let the states do their own thing again. And then all of a sudden, the Obama administration ends, this administration began, and then they have a new commissioner, and it's Jerry Milner. So the CFSR is back in full swing. Maybe a little different. And that's, that's a, a big thing. It's a vision change. Let's keep children out of foster care in the first place. That's Jerry Milner's message. Why are we even worrying about permanency? Why are we even worrying about all this stuff? Let's keep them out of the system in the first place. And New York kind of did that in some ways. 60,000, 12,000, you know how they did that? They closed the front door. They locked it. It's harder to get in. That's part of it. They did do some really good things like services for families, in-family systems, <coughs> good. But they also made it much harder to get in the door. We used to have something in New York called voluntary agreements where you could just sign your kid into care. They don't allow people to do that anymore. They now, it's, it's all court reviewed anyway, but you could literally sign your child into the foster care system and they will not let you do that very much. I was just thinking about um, <clears throat> how the, if the budget passes and how totally. that's going with that particular vision, how that you think that might influence. Probably not as much now because the next slide is the new legislation. Mm -hmm. And when legislation mandates something, you got to find money for it. That's what, what the secret is. Money is always a number one issue. If you don't got, you know, it's, and, and money is, is really on the table all the time. So, and you know, the reality is you can't do what we do without money. You can't get paid. You can't pay foster families. You can't pay whatever. But there's a lot of money on the table. And 4E is a huge pot of money, right? Not just for what you guys get, but I mean for what pays agencies to care for kids. But, but here's the next slide. This is the new legislation. Just passed. Family First Prevention Services Act, FFPSA. I'm not talking about all the legislation, but I'm sure you've all heard of ASFA, right? So that's a big one. Um, Chafee is another one, right? And then this one is brand new, just passed. And what it had by supporters, bipartisan support in Congress, that's a miracle, right? And then it was basically restructuring how money gets spent on child welfare services. So this got passed, which means now they gotta find money. It's the law. It's not like, oh, it would be nice if we could. You have to. You have to allocate funds for this. So in some ways, I don't know who the mastermind of this was, per se, but somebody was smart enough to say, if we don't pass a law about this, it's going to stay the same and there's no money. And here's what this law says. They're going to pay, give more money and more attention to in-home services, which is the front end, right? Before kids even come in, we're going to have mom, dad, whomever, grandma, who's taking care of the kids, support her or him and keep those kids at home when they safely can be kept at home. And I believe that's a great strategy. And I think most people believe that's a great strategy. The problem becomes 
if something really bad happens in the home, then they all panic, like, oh my God, like the kids got killed. Now we got to take them out of there and put them in. You know, th there's a lot of variables that you can't control with in-home services. But by and large, family-based services, um, family group conferencing, um, in-home services, they used to have something um, where they would put one social worker with two families, 24 hours a day, family builders, it was home, home builders, it was called. Whole strategy. They're going to move back to some of that. That supports Jerry Milner's vision. It supports the new legislation. They're going to really give more money to family therapy. And I'm a big believer in, and, and as somebody who's raised children myself, you can't have child therapy. Kids don't live by themselves. If you're not engaging people in the family in therapy, it's BS therapy in my opinion. Real nice to be like working out the thing with the kid, but you never meet the family, right? My, one of my kids was in therapy with a, th a psychiatrist like that, and I, I kept saying, hello, don't you think you need to meet with us? No, not really. Uh, it's, we live together. No, not really. He's a teenager. He should have freedom to have his own confidentiality. Yeah, but don't you think we should talk? No, not really. I mean, it was a waste of time. And, and as a result, he'd come home and say, my psychiatrist said that you, you know, do. And it's like, okay, well, then here's the problem, right? So you, there was no family therapy. It was individual therapy. I think kids do need time by themselves, for sure. But the, you also need to have some opportunities where it's family-oriented. So they're going to get money for that. Substance abuse services. And the big three in child welfare, and you all correct me if I'm wrong, substance abuse, mental health, domestic violence, right? Under a giant umbrella of poverty, right? How many of you work with rich families? <laughs> Middle class families? Poor people? Yeah, I mean, rich people don't come to us. We don't see them. Un unless something happens at home and they're in the emergency room and they have to call something in, and I would guarantee you they don't come to us then even. So they get diverted into family something and they call their lawyer and you know uh, they don't come to foster care generally they might occasionally but not really so i mean poverty's there substance abuse mental health domestic violence almost every case so we're going to start to look at tweaking flexibility of funds around substance abuse that's really important try getting a mom into care who has five kids who's going to take care of the kids you don't want them to go into foster care so she can go into treatment. There's no, maybe no other family. It's very complicated, right? You all know that. I mean, I, it's, it, and, and then once you get into treatment, how many of you have ever smoked cigarettes? How many of you have tried multiple times to quit? How many of you have actually quit? Okay. It's, it, you can, but it's a lot of work. I quit, I'd say, five times. And still, to, I, you know what I still do? I, I, almost every week I have this dream. I'm, I'm, I'm at a bar, I'm at a cop party, somebody gives me a cigarette, I put it in my mouth, I go to light it, I'm just about to take a big puff and I'm like, I don't smoke anymore, 25 years later, right? That's, that's strong. So I mean, think about substances and things that people are, are using for many different reasons. You know, a lot of it's about anesthetizing feeling. <clears throat> you ever, I have a great book, I don't remember the author's name, it was qualitative interviews with women who prostituted and shoplift. I don't remember the name of it. It's a great book. Every one of those women was physically or sexually abused by somebody in their family, and, and many of them lived in foster care, and it was like, okay, they didn't just one day decide to be a prostitute or shoplift, there were things that happened to them that caused them to make some of those decisions, just like some of our families who are substance abusing didn't just decide one day to take heroin. You know, there's other things that led to that. Is, is there any, I don't know if you know this, but is there any flexibility within this legislation to divert money towards stable housing or low-income housing? Probably not. You know that because that would have to go to the to the Housing and Urban Development Corporation, which is run by that guy who used to be a brain surgeon, who said that working for the federal government is harder than doing brain surgery. Ben Carson, right? Also spent thirty thousand dollars. Yeah, who thirty thousand dollars redecorating his office? But despite that diversion, um, the housing is huge, right? Our families live in cars. They live in abandoned trailers. They live in, did you see the one who lived in a cardboard box with like five kids recently in some state? It's, you know, and if you live in a state, you know, that's very urban, like New York, you know how much a studio apartment in New York City costs? And I'm not exaggerating. If you're lucky, $2,500 a month. If you're lucky, a studio apartment. 
and maybe that's Manhattan. So in the Bronx, it would be $2,000. My families can't afford that. Section 8 won't pay for something like that, so it's very complex. We have a lot of public housing in New York, but it's usually full, and there's usually a huge wait list, too. A lot of problems with that. Evidence-based practices are also going to be funded from this. I'm sure you're learning about it. If you're not, you should. I have my own feelings about them, but I think it, absolutely essential to graduate from your MSW program and know what they are, how they're used, when they're useful or not, how much they cost to implement, how you train people to use the model and the fidelity of the model. You, whether you like it or not, you need to know that. Um, and then there are some child welfare specific evidence-based practices that have evidence that do work well. How do we tap into those? Right? I don't think we should exclusively use them, that's my problem. But I think you need to know about it. Here are some things, uh, just a couple other things that are emerging. Reauthorization of the court improvement projects. Courts are essential in what we do in child welfare. They're, they're, they're like this. Every court place, every child welfare placement is approved or not by the court. We, we have to learn how to work with them, right? I recently went to court in Louisiana, and I haven't been to court in a long time, and I had to testify, and I've done training on this. I, I, was, I was stumped. They had me on the stand. They were firing questions at me, you know. This one attorney kept uh, trying to discredit me because he said I was a gay expert, not a child welfare expert. And then he said, well, we're not going to talk about gay issues today, are we? And I said, I don't intend to unless you do. And he said, no, I don't. I said, fine. And then 10 minutes later, he asked me a big question about gay stuff. And I said, I'm not answering your question. And he said, well, you need to. You have to. And I just looked at the judge and said, I'm not answering this question. He just said he wasn't going to ask me that, right? So why should I answer? And the judge said, you're right. Don't answer. But I mean. I'm confident enough to say that, but imagine, you know, you're young and you're in court and people are, it's a really hard, but this is not, a, the court authorization is about, uh, about court improvement projects. So yesterday I was talking to people at DCFS and I mentioned something about reinstatement of parental rights for older adolescents. I got two emails last night from them. Can you please hook me up to the person in Louisiana who does this? Yeah, great, I'm happy to. But that's good, because I want them to talk to each other to learn ways of changing their practices, maybe here in Wisconsin. Um, a, a reinstatement of parental rights is a strategy to work with older adolescents to get them permanency, so that if their rights were terminated by their parents when they were six, and now the kid's 18, and they don't have a resource, and mom or dad has been clean and sober for years, and really loves that kid, and the kids continue to talk to them even though they're rights were terminated, why can't we allow that parent to continue to parent? So apparently they don't do that here per se, but in Louisiana they do. So let them talk to people in Louisiana and figure out how they can change their law here, if they can. Um, there's some tribal stuff that's going on, right? Tribes are, 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 like, are like nations to themselves. So every tribe, and, and big tribes, they have their own child welfare systems. Some of them have, the, many of them have their own courts. Uh, they have their own tribal leaders. It's very different. And, and the Indian Child Welfare Act of 1979 really changed the way we look at ch caring for children um, who have Indian ancestry. But there's new AFGARs, and I put that on there. I had to look that up. I couldn't remember what AFGARs meant. Adoption and foster care analysis and reporting system. Every single state has to respond to this, to the federal government every year and say, how many kids are in care? What is the permanency goal? How many kids were adopted? So, and so now there's some Indian questions that weren't there before that now they need to include in AFGARS. If you've never looked at AFGARS and you're doing a paper, you need to. You want to find out the most recent stat of how many kids are in the system? And it's gone up, actually. It's 437,000 children in the country are in child welfare, in foster care on any given day, on those one particular day, it's a report. But that's a lot of kids, right? 110,000 are free for adoption. 50,000 were adopted last year. It's good to know those things, because on a national basis, just put in to your Google, AFGARS, and it'll pop up. The latest one. There's challenges to ICWA, Indian Child Welfare Act, in several states. Not that they're going to eliminate it, but they're challenging it. That's, that's interesting, I think. So those are some emerging things. Here's some important two themes that I feel passionately about that are not really being talked about that much anymore, but need to, in my opinion. Um, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and questioning issues. I mean, this is what I did lots of my work on. Um, during the previous administration, of course, it was talked about. In this administration, we've seen an erosion of attention to gay and lesbian issues in, in the military 
very right, um, and we've seen this particular federal government, you know, saying one thing and doing another thing. A lot of what they've done has been bashed in the courts, which is good and hopefully will continue. But and and they've done some negative stuff. They've not necessarily said in child welfare you can't do this, you can't talk about it, and they have a big grant that just got given to the University of Maryland about LGBTQ issues. And I keep saying to them, how long do you think that this is going to happen until somebody decides they're cutting your funding? And they said, we're ready for that. I said, just keep calling it LGBTQ because they don't know what that means. If you start saying gay or lesbian, then they'll look it up online and then they'll start asking you to take. When I ran the National Resource Center during the Bush administration, <coughs> I was told, take all that gay stuff off of your website. I said, but it's important. You're using federal dollars to design the website. The federal government does not want it on your website. Take it off. So we just changed the name. We didn't take it off. And they, they never asked us again about it. It said gay, lesbian, and we just changed it to LGBTQ. Nobody knew what it meant. So, I mean, I just kept saying, you know, let's, and then, and then when Obama came into office, literally, I'm not exaggerating, in a month they said, um, Gary, what about all that gay and lesbian stuff? I said, I thought you said I couldn't do that. They're like, yeah, but it's a new administration and they're asking us questions and we don't have answers. I said, yeah, you told me to take it off the website. And they said, yeah, but we know you probably didn't. And I said, I didn't and I have it. Do you want me to send it to you? Yes, I did. Like 17 pages of stuff that we did. But that's fading a little bit now. Still important. I mean, June's doing her whole doctoral dissertation on the experience of gay and lesbian, bi and trans and questioning adolescents in Wisconsin. That's fabulous. I mean, it's really important to keep looking at that. Um, and you know, and I know that some of you probably have questions about that or, or issues. I mean, it, there's, and, and it doesn't, it isn't just youth. It's also how does that impact on foster parents? And how do we recruit and retain LGBT foster and adoptive parents to care for kids? Not just gay kids. Sometimes LGBTQ folks don't necessarily want to adopt or foster a gay kid. They just want to adopt or foster a kid, right? So, you know, but those are huge implications and there's lots of material. I, I was telling you about the special issue. I, I was so impressed with how much is out there now, how many people are writing about it. And I don't think it's going to go away, but I think it's an important topic to keep on the burner. Trafficking issues. This was big in the Obama administration. I'm not hearing anything about it in a federal way anymore. This is huge. And the other thing that's so distressing about trafficking is everybody knows it's going on. High level people know it's going on. And it's not just stopping, right? I mean, whenever they have you know, Super Bowl and they'll tell you like huge groups of young women and boys were shipped in from other places. They're taking up all these hotel rooms. It's like, we know this, right? I, I did a lot of work in Indonesia with UNICEF after the tsunami there, and they were talking constantly about trafficking. I was like, I don't think we have that problem in the U.S. And it was like, yeah, you do. You just don't talk about it. And they were right. And then all of a sudden, and their Indonesian problem is, yes, sex trafficking, but it's also domestic trafficking in terms of they bring young women into countries and they make them slaves in houses to cook and clean and take care of the kids and they don't pay them and they don't let them leave and they take away their passports and that happens in the US too. But the ones that we've been talking about more is sex trafficking with young women primarily but also young boys. So uh, we're not talking about this. Um, and actually I remember being on many phone calls and you know people on the phone, there were law enforcement people and you know what they'd say? Oh, we need to put these kids in locked facilities. Wait a minute, the kids are not the ones who are the criminals. The men who are using them are criminal. Oh yeah, but we know we got to protect these kids, so we got to lock them up. And it's like, wait a minute, that doesn't seem right, right? The, and and you know, you were trying, and literally, we were trying to design this from the ground up because there were no policies about it. And then the federal government got really panicky about it. And you know, the reality is, is that some very powerful people are involved in this stuff too, very powerful people. So, mm -hmm. uh, so this is my like passion. Okay. Child sex trafficking. I actually work in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, which is a huge hub. It's actually where they yep. send a lot of people to learn how to traffic. Right. Um, so I was just wondering if you had any recommendations on articles or research or things to look help me figure out how I can start implementing some things in Milwaukee. Sure. Um, uh, actually, when we ran the National Research Center, we had great resources on our website. Mm -hmm. I think those resources have been transferred to our new website, which at the end of this, the next slide has my website address, the National Center for Child Welfare Excellence. But if you go there and you can't find it, 
email me, which is also on the next slide, and I will connect you with somebody who still works in the federal government and who did all these digital stories on trafficking, designed a curriculum for child welfare people on trafficking, and a handbook and all this stuff. And her name is Joan Morse, and Joan will, will connect you with it. But uh, on, on our website, if you look at publications or print products, you it might be there, but if it's not, just email me and I'll give you Joan's, Joni's email and she'll send you what yeah, she needs. Anyway, yeah, do anyway. I mean, and you know, and, and happy, happy to respond as you're, if you're finding things. Uh, I, I used to, our, when we ran the National Research Center, our website was so incredible. I'd be writing a grant and I would start looking for, you know, doing my literature review. All the best stuff was on my own website. You know, I, there was so much on there, you just didn't know everything that was on there. So it's, I think it's still there, but we'll help you find it. Jim? I was just going to say, um, we have Laura Jurassi, too. At the, she's a, one of our newer faculty, and that's what she studies, sex trafficking. Oh, good. Oh, really? She just wrote a book. It's really good. So oh, great. She's right at the school of social work, too. Oh, good. certain she probably knows about. What Laura Jurassi? Laura Jurassi. Okay. Can you spell her last name? Uh, G-E-R-A-S-S-I. G-E-R-A-S-S-I. Thank you. Great. Last thing, and I, I'm just being conscious of our time, is about permanency. You know, because there's been such an emphasis on well-being, and because it's like, let's keep kids out of foster care in the first place, which is all good, there's also been a de-emphasis on what does permanency look like? And that's unfortunate, in my opinion, because we still have 437,000 kids in foster care, and they need a permanency goal. But more than that, we need to be serious about what does permanency look like for this kid? And my own particular interest, even moreover, is, and what about older youth? Because these young people, who are like 16, 17, 18, can you stay in care until you're 21 here? Mm -hmm. Okay, so older even than that. It depends. It depends. It depends. Okay. Yeah. So what about that kid? So people are saying for those kids and have for a long time, oh, their permanency goal is APLA, another planned permanent living arrangement, or OPLA, or whatever they call it. They all call it different things. And you know what that permanency goal means? We don't know what we're going to do with you when you leave. They have to give them a goal, so they give them that goal. But it means basically we've given up. You're going to go out on your own, live on your own. And we know that nobody lives on their own. And then try to find, the kid doesn't have a GED or high school diploma, they have very few job skills, and now they're discharged. What do we think will happen to them, right? So, and their families, you know, scattered. They'll probably try to reunite themselves with their own family. That's what they do. More than 20% of kids who leave foster care at the age of 21 reunite themselves with their own family. And it's the fantasy of every child in child welfare. I'm going to go back to my mother. You all took me away from her, now I'm going back. It's the fantasy of every kid. I've, I've, I've met one boy in my whole career that said, if you gave me a million dollars, I wouldn't go back to that woman. One boy. The rest of them would be back there in a second, no matter what abuse they got, because it's their people, it's their family, right? They, they, and they, they believe you took me away. So they do that. And then the other thing that happens is, is that we've given up on them as a system and saying, they don't need to be adopted, they don't want to be adopted. These kids want their own crib, they want their own pad, they want their own place, this is ridiculous. Let's, let's focus on adoption of the babies. Wrong. Every kid needs a family, and we need to figure out how do we individually think about permanency for that 18 year old who might be saying don't be talking to me about no family I don't want these family people keep promising me this crap and it never gets delivered that day they say that two days later they say you know what? I've been thinking about what you said you know maybe it would be nice to have somebody special in my life but what happens is we stop at no so I've had this I do and it's that's on the website this is called unpacking the no of adolescent permanency and it's all about when they say no, how do you unpack that with them? It's really important. How do you let them interview people that will be their permanent resources? How do you find mentors? How do we use guardianship as a pathway to more durable permanency? Because kids claim the family. They're the one that says, you know what? You're my guardian. I like you. You're OK. I think you could actually be my foster parent. But if you say, we want you to be connected with her, we want her to be your foster parent, they might say, mm, I don't think so. I don't know. But the guardianship can be the pathway to something more durable. And then to adoption. I've had, I had a great uh, case in Florida like that. The kid had a mentor, 
The mentor was a guardian ad litem. The kid said, I don't want a mentor. I'm sick of this. You people keep promising me this crap over and over again. I'm sick of this. Come on, come on. This guy really wants to be a mentor. He's different. You'll like him. Kid connects with the mentor, and the kid says after a while, you know what? You're a lawyer, right? We can do guard. Can't we do this like that guardianship thing? Yep. So then he became his guardian. And then he started to be able to do home visits with him. And then the kid said, you know what? I think you should really be my foster parent, because you know, you are already anyway. And then he became a foster parent. And then the kid said after a while, you know what? I think you should adopt me, because I already think of you as my family and my parent. They claim you, rather than us identifying somebody for them. That's harder takes longer, but it's, it's one of the things that we've, we have fallen short on. And as a consequence, we have lots of young people leaving the foster care system with no permanent resources. Big problem. Those boys that connect with me on Facebook, some of them had permanent resources, many of them didn't. And my visual image of them is they're like a boat in the ocean that floats out there without an anchor. They're not crashing, they're not sinking, but they're just floating out there. So I get a lot of emails from them at their birthday, at Christmas, at Thanksgiving, you know, kind of, oh, you know, I, I hope you're doing well. You know, what did you do on Christmas? Nothing. I just stayed by. And you think, wow, they just don't have a connection. With, with some of them do, and they're great. But a lot of them are floating out there. So I think, I always feel bad, and I say to them sometimes, you know, do you think if we did better for you, you it wouldn't be like this? And some of them say, you know, Gary, if you asked me that when I was 19, I would say I don't need a family. At 30, I realized I did. But it's too late, I'm too old. It's like, no, you're not too old. But like and my own daughter Leslie, I'll tell you how I adopted her, is she was my foster daughter. She lived with me and then she went out and lives on her own. Her and I spoke at a conference one day and we were presenting and I kept saying, this is Leslie, she's my foster daughter and she talked about our relationship and somebody in the audience said, Leslie, I want to ask you a question. How come you never got adopted by Gary? And she said, because Gary Mallon never wanted to adopt me. I said, that is not true. You and I talked about this all the time. You told me, I'm white, you're black, I couldn't be your father because I'm white, and I, and, you know, or um, you didn't want to change your name, and um, a couple of other things. And she said, well, you know what, I changed my mind. And I said, well, I wish you would have told me that privately instead of in front of 500 people. I mean, this was the conversation that went on <laughs> in front of everybody. And then I said, you know, do you, and I said to her afterwards, were you just like messing with me or you really want to be adopted? And she said, no, I really want to be adopted. Okay, so here's what we got to do. You are not working right now. I am. You're going to go to the New York Family Hospital and you're going to get your records <coughs> and we're going to hire Beth Schwartz, who was a friend of mine who was an attorney, and Beth is going to help us facilitate an adult adoption. So we did that. Took a little while. She was 37 when I adopted her. She had lived with me. I had known her for 20-something years. She's now 50. She said to me in the elevator when she got adopted, because it was very disappointing. The, uh, the adoption, if you've ever been to them, they're, they're very legal proceedings, right? Some, some judges make them really nice, but this was like you know, in, a, in his chamber, and it was kind of cold. And it was like, okay, yo, you're adopted now. And she was like, that's it? And she said to me in the elevator, you know, Gary, the judge told me that when you walked out of the room that when you die, I can inherit all your money. I'm like, well, there you go. That's a big difference. Because <laughs> now you're my legal daughter. The other thing that happened that was really sad, and I, I, I should have helped her with this and I didn't realize, I, I encouraged her to go get a passport. And she's reminded me many times that we've never gone on an international trip, so she doesn't know why I needed her to get a passport, which means when are you going to take me on an international trip? But she went to get this her birth certificate, and they kept saying to her, I'm sorry, the information you gave us is not accurate. So she she, when she, when something happens to her and it's not predictable, she gets kind of hysterical. So she is hysterically crying in vital statistics. They feel terrible because they know that the information got changed when she got adopted. Under father, it says Gerald P. Mallon, not her father, legal father, or birth father's name. And her mother's name is deleted because when you get adopted, they change your birth certificate. So she's hysterical crying, carrying on. I said, put the lady on the phone. The lady gets on the phone and she's like, I'm sorry, sir, I can't tell her. I said, look, she was adopted. My name is, and she said, well, you are her legal father. That's why we couldn't give her. I said, okay, put her back on the phone. I said, change the application. You have to put me. But it was like one of those sad things, like, you know, she, she knew her parents, but she had to give up their name because I'm legally on the birth certificate, right? So it, it's one of those things that happened, but that's why I adopted her. I mean, it, and it was a very unusual adoption. You can adopt an adult. You have to sign an affidavit saying you've never had a sexual relationship with them. Because basically what used to happen before gay people got married is gay people would adopt each other. 
It's not strange. I mean, again, another thing that just is happening in policy and practice that has changed the way we do things in child welfare. These are three issues. There's a hundred of them probably a thousand of them, right? I mean, for me, these are important issues. For you, there's probably other issues that you're passionate about, out of home care, residential treatment, um, services for young women. You know, I mean, there are many, well, there's actually 50-50 in child welfare for boys and girls, but services for boys are always different from services for girls. And if you talk about juvenile justice, forget it totally different, no, almost no data out there. So there's differences there too. And there's a lot of cross, because that's another big issue. Crossover youth, youth who are in child welfare and are now in juvenile justice, pregnant and parenting teens. And when we talk about them, we only talk about girls, we never talk about boys. Right? Um, the, uh, and then educational outcomes. You know, um, Leslie took the GED test 17 times and she finally passed it. That's pretty persistent. Some of our kids leave care and don't have a GED, don't have a high school diploma, and then don't go back to get them. Some of them have done actually Mark Courtney's study the Midwest Child Welfare Study, who looked at independent living issues for older adolescents, had some interesting um, results about educational outcomes. I always think the most important finding that he had was when they went back and met these kids after they left the care, you left care, the most important finding was, did they have a relationship with somebody in their life? And, the, and many of them had a relationship with a former teacher, or a former foster parent, or a former child welfare person. Those were the major three groups that I remember. So like that's important because kids who don't have a biological family will use people that they find themselves to, to create family. So there's all of that too and lots of other things. So let me shut up and ask if you have other questions that you might want to ask or think about. Hi. Well, you were kind of talking about <coughs> what happens after they leave foster care, they age out. And I know in my class in particular, we've had a lot of discussion about what's not working, but are there any practices and or legislation that you feel actually is working to help children when they age out of care? The, like I, one of the things that I said that I, maybe not a practice or even legislation, is they have to have at least one person in their lives they're connected to. It could be by blood, it could be by choice, it could be something. My daughter Leslie calls me every single day. Right? When, some, when, and that's when I, when my mother was alive and things went bad, even when I was older, I'd say, Mom, blah, 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 and she'd say, don't worry, honey, it's gonna be better tomorrow. And I would think to myself, how does she know that? That's not even true, but it made me feel better. <laughs> and so that's what she does. Th having no one to call, I remember one girl testified in, in uh, Congress and she said, let me tell you a story. I'm a success. I have a degree. I make a good salary. I've got a full-time job. I have no permanent connection and here's what happened to me. My first week on the job, I bought myself a beautiful silk blouse. It was expensive. It was beautiful. I looked great in it and I went out to dinner that night and I dropped something on it and it was wrecked and I had nobody I could call to ask them how to take that stain out. She said, that's what it feels like when you have nobody. I mean, it's, it's horrible, right? You'd call your mother, you'd call your aunt, you'd call your grandmother, you'd call your friend, right? And that kind of stuff is what you hear from kids. I mean, we frequently say things like, oh, they have nobody to go to on Thanksgiving. Nope, they have nobody to even call when they had a bad day. So having one person at least, and what I would always say when, we were, when I ran my program is, if this kid's leaving us and we can't, we go around the table, who's connected to this kid? Nobody. Who's he connected to in the community? Nobody. Well, we have failed. This is horrible that nobody's been connected to this kid. Oh, because he's too aggressive, he's nasty, he, he's, he's abusive. That's why nobody's connected to him. Well, those are all big walls that he's put up and we've bought into that have not been able to. I have a boy I talked about yesterday who was a 54-year-old man now. He was just like that. I met him as a child, he was about 10 or 12 at St. Dominic's home where I started, okay? He was horrible. When this kid started acting out, the whole place cleared out because he was violent and he was big and he was really aggressive. I mean, you, people got hurt when he acted out. And, and he'd act up for a lot of reasons, you know? He, his home visit got canceled, um, you know, they promised him he was gonna go to this group home and he didn't go. I mean, he just would lose it. and. Um, I became his volunteer when I was at St. Dominic's. And I, and I was in college and I, we took, I took him out, we went out to the movies, I took him out to dinner.
Wagner and whatever. And you know, it was like maybe a year. And then I moved to the city, and he moved to a group home. And I still saw him a little bit, but not as much. All these years later, he finds me on Facebook and says, Gary, you, you don't remember me, blah, blah, blah. I said, no, I remember you. And, you know, I'm glad to hear from you. Let's talk. So I called him the next night. The first thing I said was, how old are you? I was thinking, you know, he was, he was 12. He's probably 30. That's what I'm thinking in my crazy mind. He was 54. And when he told me what his life was like, horrible, horrible. And he kept saying to me, but you were really good to me. And I'm like, Eddie, that was so long ago. No one else was good to you. I mean, I didn't even feel like what I did was that great. And I'm not telling you the story so I look so great. I mean, it would be a great story if I kept being connected to him for his whole life. But I mean, he, this is it. That was what he had, nothing. He had a girlfriend who was a prostitute and she killed herself. She got killed. He was on drugs and he was on drugs for years. He lived in the streets. He told me all this stuff about handing out pamphlets. I never knew so much about pamphlet handing out. You know, he, he was, um, I think he probably prostituted himself. He kind of alluded to that. He, he lived in horrible situations, but now he is clean and sober for five years. He has a job. He works as a maintenance man in a gym at night because he's so aggressive with people, he can't work with them in the day. But rather than firing him, they let him work at night alone, which is good. That's what he needed because he was a great cleaner and still is. And, um, but after talking to him, I was exhausted. I mean, I'm going to see him again next week because it's his birthday. I think he's going to turn 56. I said, let's have lunch. But I'm thinking, I've got to steal myself because I remember last time I had to go to the bed. I mean, just listening to it. So imagine living it. And this kid had hardly any connection. No family. No former foster homes. You know, a lot of stuff happened to him. And I, and I kept saying to him, you know, who are you connected to? Yeah, i got some people I know and I like. But there's no real person that's his person. And I think that's the one thing that, that kids need. And every one of them deserves to have at least one person. How do we help them find that one person? That's the issue. Right? And so the ones who are unattractive, and I don't mean that physically, just unattractive, they're the hardest ones. But they're also the ones that need it the most desperately. I think Ellen's telling me I have to stop. Sorry. Thank you very much. It was nice to meet you all.